Hello everyone, happy Saturday, happy beginning of the mid month book bash. And I wanted to share one book that I finished last night. It is called One Station Away and it's by Olaf Olafsson. Now in just embracing myself as a mood reader this year, um, I'm actually the only person that I can find that has ever discussed this book on booktube. So with that being said, let me just kind of tell you about why I picked up this book, a little bit about it, and just kind of my reactions to it. The reason I picked up this book is because Olaf Olafsson wrote The Sacrament, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And I realized recently He's written a load of other books. Why have I not read all the others? And so I decided to kind of embrace his backlist and look at previous books that he has written. And this one came out right before the sacrament. Um, now, one thing that was really interesting in watching an author interview with him, which I will link below, is that um, he is from Iceland, but he also lives in New York City. So he kind of probably has this dual citizenship. And as a result of that, um, he writes sometimes in Icelandic, sometimes in English, and the books are translated starting from either language into a variety. <laughs> Sorry, my phone is plugged in because it's about to die. Um, he will often publish a book in Iceland before it comes out in the US. Um, and he loves that staggered feeling of when the books come out. In addition, did you guys know that Iceland like subsidizes their authors? I think that's so cool that they um, basically feel that writing and reading and just being able to access books is so important that they subsidize it. So this book follows this guy named Magnus and his relationships with three different women in his life. Um, they are different types of relationships. So he is a neurologist and he's working in Connecticut. Uh, the first person in this book is a woman that becomes his patient. Basically, Magnus is researching um, this kind of locked in syndrome that a lot of people deal with for different reasons due to um, various brain conditions that can cause them to be locked in. And um, basically, um, there's a few other characters in this book who he is studying. But there is one woman who's his main patient. And she's basically in an accident and comes to him so that he can study more about her and just kind of figure out, like, is she locked in? Um, or is her brain not functioning, you know, like how present is she in this body despite not being able to communicate in the way that we typically communicate. And so that involves a lot of scans and different sort of tests that they do with her. Um, so that is the first woman. The second woman is his girlfriend, his lover. Um, she is from South America and I want to say Argentina, but anyway, uh, she's from South America and he kind of runs into her at this play. Yeah, I was trying to think if it was a play or a concert, but it was a play. Um, he just sees her like in front of him um, in the audience and is just drawn to her and um, ends up giving her his phone number and they end up forming a relationship together. And um, throughout the book, starting from the very beginning, you can tell that um, something happened to her. Um, she is not an active character in the present, I would say, um, in the book. And you know that something has happened to her, but throughout the book, you're trying to figure out what exactly it was. And along that path, because it's not so, um, linear, you also kind of discover how they met the theater, their love story, all this sorts of stuff. Um, and yes, I will say I was right about what was wrong with her, by the way. Um, and so that's another relationship that's discussed during the book. And then finally is his relationship with his mother. So his mother, um, is from Iceland and, um, lives in the UK. She's a musician who has just kind of been struggling with people not appreciating her or really being able to know who she was. And finally, towards the end of her life, when she's like, I don't know how old she is, I, thought, I think it said... 70 because I think they had a birthday party for her when she turned 70 but she finally starts to be recognized and just valued for the woman that she is however 
Um, his relationship with his mom is very, very, very complex. It's very traumatic for him. Um, there's kind of this idea that she put so much work and emphasis into her self as a musician that she didn't really have time for or interest in parenting. And so it's kind of this like, did my mother love me? Was I a bother? Um, just this weird feeling about not being very important in her life and all the emotions that go into that. So those are the three main women and the story is just beautiful in the way it goes between the different stories with the women, goes um, forward and backward through time in kind of a fluid motion. Um, and some of the themes that came up, um, I would say the main one is this idea of being locked in. So like literally Magnus as a neurologist is studying this locked in syndrome and studying different patients who are locked in and trying to figure out how much activity is actually going on in their brain. Are they able to, for example, be prompted to um, visualize playing tennis or something and then have it show up in like the motor area of their brain or the area that would light up if you were visualizing something like that. Um, and so that's like a very literal part of the story. But this idea of being locked in kind of like spans all the stories in the book and um not stories in the book the different relationships that he has in the book it is a novel it's not a book of short stories but um and the different ways that you can be locked in um as far as relationships and being locked in with your feelings and um also possibly being locked out like what right do you have to the feelings um, of others, their thoughts, their lives. Like, do you have the right to access um, these people? Um, and just this idea of boundaries too. Um, there's a lot about privacy, about secrets, um, about the experience of others. Like I said, do you have access to them? Is it your right to um, be able to know everything about a person? And then also the decisions of other people and how that can impact you um, because y there's like two situations in the, well, actually there's three, one with each woman, where the decisions of other people impact your own life and you don't have control over the decisions of other people, but their decisions can deeply, deeply impact you as a person. And I found that super interesting and I would love to discuss that with other people if anyone else reads this book as well. So beyond like this really cool theme of being locked in and the various things that that kind of takes on throughout the book, um, one of the other things that I really liked was the sex in this book and the way it was discussed. So um, Olaf Olafsson, he is very minimal in the way he discusses sex. Like obviously um, this author is in a relationship with a woman. I believe they are engaged. And um, so there's obviously intimacy. However, he, for most of the book, just really just like alludes to it or quickly mentions it without going into a lot of detail, um, which I think I would have been okay with more detail, but it was super sweet the way he talked about it. And I, I did kind of like the minimal approach. Um, however, there's one part at the very beginning where he does get slightly more descriptive. And I will say that's only like literally like maybe two or three sentences, but it was just so beautiful and it made me feel some kind of way and I thought it was really, really well done. The other thing I really liked about this book was this like tension and the desire to move forward throughout the book. Um, he kind of like gives you little hints or will tell you something and then he won't elaborate and you have to wait to find out more. Um, you have to think a lot for yourself. Like, um, for example, you know, from the very beginning that something happened to his fiance. And then as the book goes on, you start getting signs that like something's not quite right with her. Um, and like I said, I was able to identify what was wrong with her. Um, but then I had to wait to find out if I was actually right. And I ended up learning too a lot because the author is um, Icelandic. I had to 
find out about how conditions are called different things in different places and kind of like umbrella terms with a lot of things underneath them and that was really interesting to learn about but yeah there's it's literary fiction it's slow it's it's very quiet and minimal um but there is something pulling you forward and I really liked the way that was done I would recommend this book to Sarah from Your True Shelf her and I are very good at being like, listen, you need to read this book and always being right. I don't think I've, I don't think she has ever recommended a book to me that I have not loved. I don't know if I've ever been wrong about recommending a book to her. Um, however, I will say this is not one that I'm like, Sarah, you must read this. I'm like, hmm, she might like it. So we have never been wrong that I know of about each other when we're like, you must read this. This is like, mm, I think she'll like it. Um, the reason that I think that she will like it is because she's a doctor and this book um, obviously deals with medicine a lot because the main character is a doctor. He's a neurologist. Um, and the other reason that I think that she would like it is just because um, one of the characters has a bit of um, psychic abilities and it's just part of who she is it's not made um into that huge of a deal really and um her and I are both kind of interested in that sort of thing that um so yeah I think that she would enjoy that part of it as well let me just talk a little bit about mood reading and that I will wrap this up so I have been mood reading pretty much this whole year for the most part and it has just impacted me so much because I feel like I'm drawn to books without even realizing like why I would be drawn to them so this book obviously I wanted to read because I read and loved the sacrament but this book fit into a little phase of my life that I'm in right now um, without me really paying attention to actively making a decision that would make it fit into my life right now so Heather from Year Two Shelf talked about parenting in a video and she was talking about how kids go through phases and like whatever your kid is up to have no fear don't worry it's a phase even if it's something good uh oh maybe you should be worried because it's a phase it's gonna go away and I don't know that I believe that only kids go through phases maybe it's just me who has not fully developed or something but I go through phases as well and one of my phases right now that I'm really into is this idea of radiology so as you guys know or many of you may know I am at a super 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 high risk for best breast cancer and something just happened um in my life that I think increased my risk even more I'll find out on Monday when I go meet with my genetic counselor but basically um because of that I'm on a high risk screening program which involves a lot of things obviously it involves a monthly self breast exam it involves an MRI every single year um which is amazing because a lot of times you can pick stuff up on an MRI that you won't be able to see in other scans. It also involves um, a 3D mammogram once a year, and then it also involves two clinical breast exams. And all these things are spread out over the course of a year. So every few months I'm getting something and I'm getting some way to monitor so that if anything ever happened to me, it would be caught really soon. And the reason that this idea of radiology is on my mind is because I recently had my annual breast MRI. It came back wonderful and I was so excited because um, the person that read my test or whatever, my scan, was my favorite radiologist in the entire world. And let me just tell you, to have a favorite radiologist <laughs> tells you something about how much I go to the hospital and I go to preventative healthcare sort of places. Anyway, I feel like most people have no idea who it is that's reading their scans and I love mine so, so much. She's the most amazing human. And thinking about that really launched me into this idea of like how much I appreciate her. Like, first of all, I love her like as a person. She is so comforting, so loving, so fun. Um, but thinking of her as a doctor, how much I appreciate her for the work that she does for me. Um, because 
for years and years, I just had this like crippling anxiety about medical stuff all the time. There would be once, I would say once a year for sure, where I was convinced that something was wrong with me, that blah, blah, blah. And I, it wouldn't just be like, I needed to go to the doctor to get it checked. It would be like, I had like, I was really worried about this. Like it was impacting myself. Um, anyway, and since being on this high risk treatment plan, it just really makes me feel so empowered in my healthcare. And it makes me feel that, you know, I can't control um, that I have a high risk for breast cancer. There's obviously lifestyle things I can do that will um, try and like put my body in a stronger place for fighting cancer one day or put my body in a place where it's less likely to get cancer. Um, but at the end of the day, I am dealt with the cards that I have and basically seeing a genetic counselor once a year and having all these scans, um, they just make me feel empowered that if I were to get cancer, that it would be caught really, really early. And obviously that's not a guarantee that the outcome is going to be okay, but it just makes me feel empowered and it makes me feel really good. And I'm not scared to get these scans anymore, really. Um, so anyway, and I was just thinking about what value a radiologist has. And then I started looking up YouTube videos of like a day in the life of a radiologist and all this stuff. And then I was like, you guys, I want to go back. I want to go to like to medical school, 35 years old. And I was thinking about this and number one, this is a phase. I'm not actually going to do it. Okay. This is a phase. But number two, I did have an interesting conversation with somebody who went uh, back to school to be an eye doctor when she was around my age. And um, it was just really amazing to hear her perspective about it and her wisdom because she talked about this interview where people like called her out being like, listen, like, you're really old, basically. I don't know their wording. Um, and she just with her sweet, sassy self basically told them that she was going to be like, they were like talking about how you're going to be X age when you finish. I don't remember, but just say like 45. She's like, well, I'm going to be 45 anyway. I might as well be a doctor you know? And so I like that idea that it's never too late that you can always go back to school. But with that being said, I am telling you this is a phase I'm not going to medical school. But I do think the idea of being a radiologist sounds super cool. I love the idea of like prevention and of catching things super early. I also love that you are the point person who figures out what is finally wrong with someone um, because pretty much everyone <laughs> has some sort of scan to figure out what's wrong with them and you are the person that is responsible for figuring it out. Obviously the doctors like order the scans and stuff like that um, but at the end of the day you're the one that solves the mystery and allows the doctors to have access to the information that they need to to treat their patient. Um, but as far as like the actual work of it, I think it would be perfect for me because, um, I'm such an introvert, right? And, um, I need time to be alone. And I love the idea that for a radiologist, a lot of your time is spent in a reading room by yourself, reading scans, drinking your coffee, going at whatever pace you need to go at, just living your life, you know? talking into your microphone thing, whatever, your dictator. Um, I think that would be a nice part of the job, but that's not what you do all day. So that would be nice to have like an introvert section of your day. You also are collaborating with loads of other people because as I said, pretty much every doctor works with you. Um, and so you have the opportunity to connect with other doctors, to collaborate, to discuss scans and to say like, this is what I think. This is why I said that. Let's look at the scan, whatever, whatever. I don't know how often that actually happens because I assume most doctors just read the report and call it good, but I assume that there is some level of communication. And then the other thing um, too is that um, my favorite doctor in the entire world, um, she only focuses on breasts. And so um, she um, basically last year had to do a MRI guided biopsy on me. And um, one of the reasons that I have never gone into any sort of medical career, despite this draw I have to hospitals and the medical 
setting. I've always had that. It's really weird, really weird. I love visiting people in hospitals. I love hospitals. I have never considered too much going into medicine besides like passing thoughts here and there because I'm not good at medical emergencies. I'm not good at blood. And um, the breast doctor, um, she is able to do biopsies, but I feel like for that, it would be like, at least for me, the, the MRI guided biopsy, it's such a minimal, like such a tiny amount you take out. I feel like the blood is such a contained and expected environment. Like I don't like unexpected blood. I don't like squirting blood. I don't like missing bits of bodies or mangled bits of bodies, but a biopsy you you have the control of you know what to expect and it's minimal anyway um so that would be cool too to be able to have a hands-on part of your day um yeah and anyway so that is my random phase I'm in right now is being really interested in radiology and um this book kind of fit with that um, just because um, he's a neurologist, he was doing MRIs on uh, people that were locked in. And um, yeah, I just think it's cool that when you mood read, you have books come to you that fit whatever you're interested in at the moment or whatever your phase you're in. And yeah, so I highly recommend mood reading. I think that more of you should mood read because then we are left with a rambling, rambling, really long video about a book that no one else has reviewed on booktube. So I'm curious if I have convinced you guys to read this book by Olaf Olafsson or any other book by him. Um, I just think he's amazing and I will definitely be reading the rest of the books that he has published. Um, but yeah, what is an author that you guys have read that nobody talks about and you just want to be like, please read stuff by this author? Uh, yeah, let me know. I'm going to head to the coffee shop and read another book. Hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you later for a different video review. But yeah, I hope you guys have an amazing afternoon, loads of reading and enjoy your mid-month book bash. <laughs>